Hello everyone, my name is Sahil and today I'll be talking about some efficient approximation schemes for stochastic probing and profit problems. So the title might look complicated, but basically we are interested in finding 1 plus epsilon approximation schemes for some stochastic discrete problems. This is joint work with Danny Segev, who is at Tel Aviv University. So let's start off with a simple discrete optimization problem, which I call the top R hiring problem. The high level goal here is I give you n candidates and you want to hire r of them for your firm and your goal is to maximize the sum of their values. So formally what is the discrete optimization setup usually? It's you have some finite universe, you can think of these as your n candidates, you have an objective function which is maybe the sum of the values of the candidates that you hire and you have some constraints, maybe you can hire at most r of them. The goal is to find in polynomial time a solution, a feasible set, which satisfies your constraints so as to maximize or minimize your objective function. So this is a very classical setup. And I mean, I, the reason I'm telling you is just to clarify some notation. And it can be used to capture many, many problems. For instance, there are many, many maximization and minimization problems, which are in this discrete optimization setup. And there are several books written on this topic. What we are interested in is, like, what if the input to this optimization problem is uncertain? So there's some uncertainty where the input uncertainty can take many, many forms. For instance, like what if the values of the candidates that you are interviewing, they are stochastic, they're drawn from some probability distributions. You don't know how what's their value a priori. Like what if you are interviewing these candidates one by one and you have to make decisions without knowing the values of the future candidates. So there are many, many such stochastic or like many other forms of uncertainties that can appear in your problem. The question is, how do we solve this broad set of stochastic discrete optimization problems? And like, how can we design the optimal algorithms or the optimal policies? So to make it more concrete, let's look at the classical profit inequality problem. So in this problem, there are n random variables, x1 to xn, you know their distributions. So think of these as x1 to xn, some n boxes or like n candidates. You know the distribution of each candidate, but you don't know the exact value of a candidate. You can find out the value by interviewing them. So you interview these candidates one by one sequentially. As soon as you finish an interview, you get to see their value and you have to immediately decide whether you're hiring them or not. And you can hire only at most one candidate. So maybe you see x1, x1 equals four. Maybe you decide, okay, not to hire it. You see x2, x2 equals six, and maybe you decide to hire it. So that's your value. So the algorithm basically stops at x2 equals six. That's the reward it gets. I mean, had it continued, maybe it could have seen some higher values. Maybe x4 was 10, but I mean, it cannot now go back. The decision has been already made. The goal is to maximize the value. And this is the classical profit inequality problem. Uh, you can study generalizations of this problem, like such as the top R hiring, where out of in boxes, you're hiring R of them and you want to maximize the sum. But let's just focus our attention on R equals one, the single item profit inequality problem. This problem has several applications, primarily in mechanism design, online algorithms. And I mean, I won't get into this here because I mean, this is a topic which has also been covered at the tutorial in EC this year. So, okay, now what's known about here, this problem? So there are two common benchmarks for the profit and equality problem. One is the expected max of all the random variables. Think of this as the hindsight optimum. And what's known about this expected hindsight optimum is that Although you cannot get the optimal value, you cannot meet this benchmark because you're making decisions without knowing the future values of the candidates. There are simple threshold based algorithms which will get you at least half of this benchmark. So, so they're like, uh, this, they are, this, this is a classical result and this half is also known to be tight, so you cannot do better on the worst instances. Another benchmark for such profit and equality problems is the optimal policy. So by optimal policy, I mean the optimal algorithm which only knows the distributions. So you're only comparing yourself to the best possible algorithm. You're not comparing yourself to the best possible hindsight optimum. And this optimal policy has a simple dynamic program. So in case you haven't seen this before, here's like a nice picture to illustrate this. So on the y-axis is the value of your algorithm and on the x-axis is the number of boxes. So the way to look at this is from the end. So the last box, your algorithm should always take it. So Vn, which is the expected value of your algorithm on reaching n, is basically just expected value of xn. Vn minus one is the expected max of, of uh, Vn and xn minus one, because your algorithm should just take xn minus one whenever it's higher than Vn. And you can now solve this dynamic program from back to n. So this is a great solution. It's polynomial time and it's optimal. 
So it just it's optimally solves this problem. So in today's talk, we'll be interested in like variants of this second benchmark. In particular, we are interested in the question: what if the order of these boxes is not a priori fixed? So what if your algorithm can choose? Maybe it wants to maybe interview candidate number three first, then it decides to maybe interview candidate number one, five, seven, whatever. So what can we do it? I mean, it's no, it's no longer clear. Like there's, there's a simple dynamic program to solve it. And this is also known as the free order profits problem, profit inequality, where again, you have these end distributions, but the order, like these labels one to end don't have any significance. You can interview them in any order. And the goal is still the same. You interview and you have to immediately decide whether you're hiring them or not. So what's known about this free order problem? Again, you can study both the benchmarks. One is the expected max benchmark. Here it's known that you can do better than a two approximation. However, you cannot do get like the, the optimal thing. So the exact approximation ratio is not known, but it's somewhere between uh, like the inverse of 2.5 and one. So it's somewhere between this thing. The other benchmark, which is what we are more interested in, is the optimal policy, the optimal algorithm. Now you might wonder, is this optimal algorithm allowed to be adaptive? So by adaptivity, I mean it interviews a candidate. Depending on the outcome of this, the value of this candidate, if it accepts, then the game ends anyways. If it does not accept, is the algorithm allowed to choose the next candidate to interview based on the value of the current candidate? Is it adaptive? So what can be shown is actually, this was already shown by Hill in the 80s, that actually adaptivity does not help with, for this problem. So you can always assume that the optimal algorithm is just a fixed order. It just goes in some sequence. This order is unknown to you. I mean, your algorithm has to find it, but it's some fixed order in which the candidates are going to be interviewed. And then at some point, your algorithm may decide to stop and hire some candidate. So what's known for this problem? That the, finding the optimal algorithm turns out to be in behind. So you cannot find it in polynomial time. However, for some simple distributions, like two-point distributions, you can do better than a two approximation. And this raises the question, uh, that can we do better? Like, can we get a p-task for this problem, for instance? Like, we cannot get the optimal solution. Can we get a one plus epsilon approximation in polynomial time? And one can ask the same question for other discrete optimization problems, like for stochastic discrete problems, such as like the ones I mentioned on the first slide. Like, can we hope to get a p-task for such problems, like a one plus epsilon approximation solutions? Uh, before getting into like uh, the, the, our results for this, let's look at another stochastic optimization problem, the so-called probe max. So it's again quite similar in the sense that you have n boxes. Again, think of these as the n candidates uh, for which you don't know the outcomes. You only know their distributions. This time, however, your algorithm has a constraint that it can only interview at most k of these candidates. So there's no constraint of the form that you have to sequentially interview. Like you have to interview them in this like sequence one to n. However, you have a constraint that you can only interview at most k of them, a set s of size at most k. And then among these k candidates, you are going to get the best one. So it's not an online problem. However, you still have to decide like which k candidates to interview. And then again, there are generalizations. So this problem has again been studied deeply. It has many, many applications to many optimal search problems. And for instance, it's even interesting for the hiring problem, there are oil drilling problem and many others. So what's known here? So again, you can ask the same question, whether you are allowed to, your algorithm is allowed to be adaptive or non-adaptive. Like, is it allowed to choose these sequence of candidates one by one and the next candidate depends on the outcome of the value or not? And here it turns out that the adaptive and non-adaptive solutions are actually different. So unlike the free order profits problem, the two problems can give you potentially different solutions. And there are like simple examples, even for three boxes and very simple constraints, like at most two you can throw. There are already very simple things, which shows that the gap, there is a gap. So I'm just going to flash the example, but I mean, you don't need to understand it. There's like a very simple example where you do some very simple calculation. The adaptive solution has a higher value than the non-adaptive solution, than the optimal non-adaptive solution. So now, the question is again, like, okay, for all this probe max problem, can I find the optimal solution, maybe both the optimal and optimal non-adaptive solutions in polynomial time? Because these both the solutions are different. I mean, adaptive and non-adaptive, can I find both of them in polynomial time? And you might ask, okay, why am I even interested in non-adaptive solutions? So all the non-adaptive solutions give you smaller, sim smaller values as compared to the adaptive ones. They are much simpler because you a priori decide which are the key Max boxes or key candidates you're going to interview. Hence, for some applications, it's nicer to have a non-adaptive solution. 
So they have their benefits. And both these problems, the non-adaptive and the adaptive probemax, have been previously studied. In fact, for both of them, we already know what PTAS. We can get a one plus epsilon approximation in polynomial time. And there are also some hardness results known for the non-adaptive problem. Now, this raises the question, can we do anything better? So we already know like maybe some hardness results as well for the non-adaptive. Can we do anything better than a PTAS? So what we are interested in now is something called as the efficient polynomial time approximation scheme also known as the EPTAS. So it's again very similar. The major difference is that this time, the one plus epsilon approximation, uh, you have to find in F of epsilon times poly n time. So why, why is this interesting? So look at the function of the form n to the one plus epsilon. So this is a PTAS, but this is not an EPTAS. And EPTASs have turned out to be useful for many applications because even for very simple values of epsilon, turns out PTASs are impractical, even for epsilon equals 0.1, but EPTASs are useful. They, they can be more practical. Good. So the question that we are asking is, can we find an EPTAS for these uh, probe max problems? So our main results in this result, in this paper, is that for all these problems, like for free order profits, as well as for both adaptive and non-adaptive probe max, we can actually get an EPTAS, which is a one plus epsilon approximation in polynomial time. And uh, the main idea, the proof technique that we use is always to reduce our stochastic discrete problem into some kind of a scheduling problem. So I'll tell you what the scheduling problem is, but you might have heard of scheduling problems where you have a bunch of jobs that you want to schedule onto machines. So we can define such a scheduling problem and you solve these discrete stochastic optimization problems. And I mean, okay, we have some other results in the papers as well, like the techniques extend to some other problems, such as like the top R problems or Pandora's box as well. So the outline is that I just told you what are our results. Now I'll give you like a high level idea of how we solve the free order profits problem. And then I'll conclude with some extensions and open problems. So like the prof free order profits problem, again, as I was saying, you have these n random variables. Your algorithm has to choose an order in which it wants to interview these candidates, and then it can hire at most one of them. And it has to make these decisions irrevocably. And as I was saying, adaptivity does not help for this problem. You can assume that the optimal solution is actually just a fixed order. And let's, for simplification of the notation, let's assume that this optimal order is nothing but 1 to n. So x1, x2, x3, and so on. Of course, your algorithm does not know this order. I mean, it does not know which one is x1, which one is x2, and so on, because otherwise it can just solve the dynamic program and be done with it. Also, for simplicity, I mean, you can also think of now that, again, you can, once this order is fixed, the optimal solution is nothing but the sim given by the simple dynamic program, like where vn star is nothing but the expected value of xn, and you can solve this recursive dynamic program. And that's the optimal solution. Like, once the order is done, of course, your algorithm doesn't know this order. And also without loss of generality, let's assume all these random variables are bounded between zero and one, and we are fine with getting like an additive epsilon approximation. These are again simplifying assumptions which can be made without loss of generality. So good, now what's the main idea? So the main idea of our algorithm is the following. It basically says like there is some optimal solution and it has such a figure like this decreasing set of values. Let's just classify these values into some consecutive random variables. And I call these consecutive random variables as buckets. So you have a sequence of buckets so as denoted by these square boxes, by these rectangular boxes in the figure. So the goal is that although your algorithm doesn't know which random variable is being is appearing in where in this sequence, in this optimal sequence, you define small classes of buckets which contain a set of random variables. And you think of your revised goal as just assigning each random variable to one of these buckets. So the buckets are going to capture somehow the summary of like what's the net contribution of the set of random variables in this, in this box. And of course, you have to be careful about how you define these boxes. And okay, I mean, the point is because the number of boxes that we define is only small, is only like poly one over epsilon, hence you can guess the entire net contribution of a box using some hyperparameters. And uh, with this, you can, once you know these hyperparameters, then it's just a scheduling problem because you want to just assign your n random variables into these poly one over epsilon boxes while meeting these constraints that you need to meet these hyperparameter constraints. To say it a bit more formally, the buckets that we define is look at this optimal solution and now look at multiples of epsilon in this optimal solution from, from one end to another. 
and like whatever is the set of random variables that fall in the same interval in the same like this horizontal interval multiple like the same value of epsilon uh, that go into the same bucket so once you have this multiples of epsilon these buckets like the first variable goes in a bucket of its own primarily because it could potentially give you a lot of value i mean so although there are multiple variables the first variable we call it a jump bucket which we need to kind of handle separately Whereas all the other variables in this bucket, they are called as the stable bucket, and they can be handled simpler because their net contribution is at most an epsilon, whereas the first variable could potentially give you a lot of additional value. So, I mean, okay, there's some catch, but that's the main level idea. And even though you have like now twice the number of buckets, it's still only like two over epsilon buckets. And hence, you can hope to guess the, the net contribution of a bucket. So this is what I call the base value. So the base value is like how much is the contribution of the buckets after this current bucket. So I mean, it's some kind of a capturing the summary, like how much is the net value that we are getting from the future. And once we know this base values, then we are in a good shape because it basically becomes some kind of an integer program, a linear program. So in what is this linear integer program, you just have these uh, boxes, like random variables, you, which you need to assign to these buckets, these two over epsilon buckets. You have some constraints that, okay, each random variable goes to at most one bucket, and also each jump bucket gets at most one variable. And you have a constraint that the net contribution to a bucket should be at least the total value of that effective uh, bucket. So formally, this is, can be written as the sum of the expected marginal values of these random variables inside a bucket. That should at least be the net value of the the total value of this bucket, which is nothing but the difference of the base values. And okay, I mean, once we can solve the scheduling problem, we get basically our EP test. And that's what we do. And the high level proof idea is just you solve the LP relaxation of this problem and solve it using dependent routing based on ideas of Chikori, Wondrock, and St. Lucens. So I won't go into these details, but that's the high level idea. So finally, to conclude, like our results also extend to stochastic probing problems. For instance, like the probe max where you have to interview at most K candidates, again, we can get a EP task. The main techniques are still the same. You define these buckets and hyperparameters. The only difficulty is that the scheduling big problem becomes more complicated. It becomes some kind of a multi-dimensional problem, but which can be handled. We also have results for Pandora's box and for selecting R items. And again, we get P tasses for EP tasses actually for many of these problems, like EP tasks. So finally, to conclude, we have like EP tasks for many of these problems. The high level techniques are just to define these disjoint buckets and guess hyperparameters, and then we solve some scheduling problem. There are several open problems, such as can we get an FP task or can we show hardnesses beyond NP hardness? Thank you.